Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Kindly support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making such audiobooks for you. The Muslim Conquest of Persia by Lieutenant General A. I. Akram This book tells in detail about the Arab conquest of Persia, also known as the Arab conquest of Iran, during the Rashidun Caliphate from 633 to 654 AD. This conquest brought the fall of the Sassanid Empire, which was in power for over four centuries, while rivaling its neighbor, the Eastern Roman Empire of Byzantine. Start of Chapter 9 The Day of Secure The night passed. The Bani Asad reoccupied their original position in the Muslim center. The men rested and fed. Most of the Muslim wounded were evacuated and their wounds dressed and except for those who were totally incapable of combat, rejoined their comrades for the second day of battle, which they hoped would be the last. The Persians had as many followers, slaves and servants, as they had soldiers, and these followers saw to the administrative duties, which follow a hard day's fighting. The Muslim followers, however, consisted of the wives and children of the soldiers, and these faithful souls did for their men all that was needed. They cooked the food, they dressed the wounded, and later they dug the graves and buried the dead. At sunrise, both armies again formed up for battle. Saad ordered that the dead be evacuated and buried and a search be carried out for any wounded soldiers who had not yet been found. Some wounded men were found and handed over to the women, and all dead bodies were evacuated from the battlefield and carried on camels to Uzeb, where they were buried on both sides of the Wadi Musharraq, a small valley between Uzeb and Anushams. This second day of battle would become known as the Day of Secur, because of the arrival of reinforcements from Syria. It would be a day of chivalry, because of the glorious and exciting duels fought by champions of the two armies. It would be a day on which the Muslims would get very near victory, and the Persians would remain on the defensive, because of the heavy casualties which they had suffered the day before, and the absence of elephants from the battlefield. Many elephants had been wounded in the first day fighting, and all had their equipment, including the hodas, damaged. This equipment was being repaired and the wounded elephants treated for their wounds. The two armies watched each other intently till about the middle of the morning, and then the fighting was resumed on the orders of Saad and on the same pattern, duels preceding the general engagement. There were a large number of duels this day. Sometimes a Muslim would advance and throw a challenge, and sometimes a Persian. Some duels ended quickly while others were prolonged contests. In some the vanquished withdrew from combat to save his life, but in most duels defeat meant death. The corps commanders themselves came out to fight, and showed their prowess with arms. Jalinus threw a challenge for single combat, which was accepted by Tuleha. After some fighting, Tuleha landed his sword on the head of the Persian general, and the sword cut the Persian's helmet, but stopped just short of the scalp, wherever Jalinus beat a hasty retreat. And this was just as well for the Persians, because he was to play an important part in the conduct of the battle on its last day. In another duel, a Persian officer came forth for single combat. He was killed by his Muslim adversary, 
but before he fell, he was able to inflict a mortal wound on the Muslim, whose name was Ilba bin Jahash. Ilba lay on the ground beside the body of his vanquished foe, with his intestines hanging out of his belly. A little later, with the help of another Muslim, he was able to cut them into his body and wrap himself to keep them in. Then he began to crawl towards the Persian front line and was only 15 meters away from the Persians when death overtook him. With his last breath, he recited a couplet. I look for merit with our Lord. I was of those who fought the best. In another duel recorded by chroniclers, Awar bin Qutba fought a Persian noble known as Shahryar of Sijistan, and both killed each other. And so this magnificent and gory drama rolled on, with most of the honours being won by the Muslims, until a little before noon a small cloud of dust was seen rising in the south. At this time, on the western front, the Muslims were besieging Jerusalem. After inflicting a crushing defeat on the Romans at Jermuk, the Muslims had retaken Damascus and thereafter, on the orders of Caliph Umar, Abu Ubadah had marched to Jerusalem and invested the holy city. The siege was to last more than five months until April 637, but a few weeks before the Battle of Qadisiyah, while Rustam was on his way to the battlefield, Umar had written to Abu Ubadah to dispatch whatever force he could spare from his theatre to strengthen Sa'ad against the Persians. In response to the Caliph's orders, Abu Ubadah sent a force of 1,000 men under the command of a nephew of Sa'ad named Hashim bin Utba bin Abi Waqas. Hashim travelled along the northern Arabian route via Domatul Jandal, the present al Jaf. He sent Kaka bin Amr with 700 men ahead of the rest, and Kaka, once on his own, was able to secure a whole day's advance over Hashim and the remaining 300. As the first day of Qadisiya ended, Kaka was camped two days' march south of the battlefield on the main Arabian route, and it was in this camp that Kaka received information, two days old, that battle was imminent. Taking 100 of his fastest horses and 100 of his bravest men, he set off for Qadisiya, instructing the remainder to follow on and make the best possible speed. Arriving near the battlefield, Kaka sensed that the Muslims would be under pressure and could do with a morale boost. He thought of a method which would heighten the psychological effect of his arrival. Dividing his 100 men into tens, he gave instructions that each group of ten would follow the one before it after a short interval so as to arrive on the battlefield separately and thus remind the Muslims and the Persians several times that Muslim reinforcements were coming. And in this manner, the last stage of the journey was carried out. Kaka, leading the first group of ten, arrived on the battlefield and came into the Muslim right center from behind. This was shortly before noon. As he arrived, he gave the cry of Allahu Akbar, and this rousing call of Islam was taken up by the Muslims, who were thrilled at the arrival of Kaka, for who did not know of Kaka, the man who was as good as an army. Kaka was a brother of Asim bin Amr, and two nobler brothers, two more valiant, more dashing, more chivalrous, it would be difficult to find. The two had fought together under Khalid bin al-Walid in his campaign in Iraq and were his most trusted lieutenants. When Khalid marched to Syria, Kaka went with him and was present at every battle fought in the west where he covered himself with glory. He was one of the two stalwarts who, along with Khalid, 
had scaled the walls of Damascus, which led to the storming of the city and its fall to the Muslims. His work on the battlefield had been predicted by Caliph Abu Bakr, who once said, before Khalid's invasion of Iraq, No army can be defeated if its ranks possess the likes of this man. And now Kaka had come. Kaka was not the man to waste time when there was good fighting to be done. Disregarding the fatigue of his long ride, he rode forward towards the Persian line and called, Who will duel? We do not know why the Persians did not come forth to accept the challenge. Perhaps they remembered the Muslim champion from days gone by. Perhaps they recognized him as the brother of Asim. Whatever the reason, there was silence in the Persian front line until at last, Bahman came forward to accept combat with the young challenger. Eyebrows was known as very able general and a gifted fighter, and the fact that he was getting on in years did not deter him from wishing to show the youngsters how great duels are fought. Who are you? asked Kaka. I am Bahman Jazawi, replied the Persian. Kaka at once recalled the Battle of the Bridge, of which he had heard accounts in Syria. Now, he exulted, I take revenge for Abu Ubaid and Salid and the people of the bridge. Hardly were the words out of his mouth when Kaka attacked his adversary. Bahman fought skillfully to defend himself, but was no match for the young Muslim champion. Kaka killed the Persian general and in doing so inflicted upon the Persian army the greatest single loss that it was possible for it to suffer. This was a kind of death, however, which Bahman himself, a professional soldier, who was once an officer of Anushirwan the Just, would have liked to die. Again Kaka threw a challenge and this time, the commander of the Persian left centre rode forward, accompanied by another officer. Seeing two Persians emerge from the Persian ranks, one of Kaka's men rode up to him and the two peers met in single combat. Kaka killed Birzan and the other Muslim killed the other Persian. Now Kaka returned to the Muslim line. O Muslims, he called, greet them with the sword, only the sword do men kill, do as I do. The duel with Birzan was fought at about noon. As the duel ended, Saad gave the order for the general attack, hoping to achieve on this day the victory which had eluded the Muslims the day before. The Muslim regiments again swept forward, picking their way over the bodies of fallen foes, and clashed with the Persian mass arrayed in front of them. But the Persians stood like a rock in the path of Muslim attack and although a large number fell in combat, they repulsed every attack. The most difficult nut which the Muslims had to crack, and they were unable to crack it, was the Persian heavy cavalry which stood forward of the Persian army, intimately supported by the heavily armed infantry. Fighting increased in intensity and casualties began to mount on both sides but the Persians could not be shaken. After an hour or two of this, the Muslims pulled back to their own position and both sides got a little time to rest. It was during this break that Kaka, with Saad's permission, put into effect an extremely ingenious trick. Collecting a number of camels, he got some men to rip up large wooden structures which were covered with cloth and placed firmly on the camels' backs. The faces of the camels were also covered, and by the use of props of various kinds, the shape of the camels' heads was distorted to make them look like weird monsters. So camouflaged, these camels were ridden through the Muslim lines and directed at the enemy cavalry, which stood nearest to them. 
The Persian soldier was tough. He was trained to face any manner of attack, any kind of weapon, any race of men, and any breed of horse. But he had never been prepared to stand in the path of a huge, towering monster which looked like nothing on earth. He wilted. Many Persians, more intelligent and more steady than others, reasoned that this was a ruse, really camels dressed to look like unearthly creatures. But the Persian war horse could not reason. It knew humans, it knew camels, horses and elephants, but it could not be expected to fight a being which could only be described as the thing. There was a short, sharp struggle between horse and rider. Then the Persian horses standing in the path of the oncoming super beasts turned and fled, knocking down Persian infantrymen on way and nothing but the river Atik could arrest their flight. As the remaining Persians on this part of the front re-established some semblance of order, Kaka led the camels along the space between the two armies. After parading his special animals for a short distance, he turned them in the direction of the Persians, and no sooner had they got near the Persian front than the Persian horse turned and bolted. In fact, the Persian horses were more frightened of the Arab super camels than the Arab horses had been of the Persian elephants. And this went on for some time until most of the Persian cavalry was dispatched from the battlefield without a blob being struck. Had this not been a bloody battlefield with thousands of corpses littering the ground, the scene would have been comical. As it happened, it delighted the Muslims and left the Persians in much confusion and some dismay. It was now a little before sunset. The time was ripe for another attack. The Persians, abandoned by their cavalry, stunned by the spectacle of the strange beasts, Disorganized by the gaps which suddenly appeared in their midst due to the flight of the cavalry, were extremely vulnerable and a determined attack would have every chance of throwing them off balance and robbing them of all cohesion. With clear judgment, Saad seized the opportunity and ordered a resumption of the attack. The Muslim army again went into action. The mounted groups made for gaps left by the departed Persian cavalry, and the rest of the army closed up to the Persian line and struck to finish this army once and for all. The progress achieved showed every promise of victory. Some of the Persian units broke under the force of the Muslim attack and made for the river bank, and the exulting attackers drove several wedges into the Persian front. Through the gaps thus created, the Muslim horse and foot penetrated deep towards the rear of the Persian army. Kaka had now joined his brother Asim and his tribe of Bani Tamim in the left center, and the two brothers worked wonders in the hard fighting which was taking place, dazzling everyone, friend and foe, with their skill, strength and dash. On this day, Kaka made a total of 30 sallies and killed a total of 30 Persians, one in each sally. His last victim was a noble named Buzurj Mihir. Along with other Muslim units, the Bani Tamim also struck deep into the Persian mass. Kaka led a group of men through the Persian center towards Rustam's headquarters, and as he approached it, the Persian army showed every sign of collapsing. The Muslim victory was clearly in sight, perhaps only an hour away, and since the sun had just set, there was little time to lose. If they could get Rustam, all resistance would collapse. So Kaka made a determined bid for the Persian commander-in-chief. Rustam's world was crumbling around him. But he was too great a man and too fine a general to give up the struggle while the least hope remained. Having been in countless battles, 
He knew that the fortunes of war were fickle and one or two events could turn the tide of battle. There was certainly ample hope. It was getting dark. That helped only a little because there was a good moon, but it was something. If he could keep his army in being over the night, the entire situation would change, for in the morning his elephants would be back in action and then he could turn the tables on the invaders of his land. Rustam drew his sword and personally led a counter-attack against the Bani Tamim. This was a signal for a last desperate effort by the Persians to stave off defeat, and the Persian army rose to heroic heights in fighting off the Muslim groups which had penetrated their front. Soon the sky darkened, but there was no disengagement as the two armies remained locked in fierce combat in the light of a bright, clear moon. Slowly and steadily the Persians loosened the vice-like grip of the desert army. Slowly and steadily the Muslims were forced out of the Persian position, and having come within an inch of victory, surrendered their gains and fell back to no man's land. Having struggled mightily against a force twice its size, the Muslim army was too exhausted to hold or press its advantage, though not too exhausted to fight on. The Persians re-established their line of battle as in the morning, but the slogging went on relentless and unmerciful. One of the bravest of the Muslims was taking no part in this battle. He was lying on the damp floor of a cellar in the castle of Uzeb, with his legs in irons. This was Abu Mehjan of the Saqif, cousin of Abu Ubad, martyr of the bridge. In the days of ignorance, Abu Mehjan had been fond of the bottle and living it up. He was even then a fearless fighter, and also a bit of a poet. In early 9 Hijri, when the Holy Prophet وسلم, besieged Taif, Abu Mehjan's hometown, Abu Mehjan fought with distinction against the Muslim army and with an arrow mortally wounded Abdullah, son of Abu Bakr. Soon after, however, when the Saqif submitted to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and accepted Islam, Abu Mehjan too became a Muslim and proved staunch in his new faith, except that he did not totally abjure drink and would now and then give in to the temptation. At the Battle of the Bridge, Abu Ubad appointed him commander of the cavalry and he showed a great deal of courage in that battle. He was one of those who attacked and drove back the elephant which crushed Abu Ubad to death. When Abu Ubad's army disintegrated after the disaster of the bridge, Abu Mehjan stayed on with Mutanna at Ulais for a while and then returned to Medina. At Medina, Umar caught him drinking and exiled him to Bez, an island off the coast of the Yemen. We do not know what his sentence was, but shortly before the Battle of Qadisiya, he was released and came on his own to join the army of Saad. In camp, however, he drank again, and Saad, on discovering his offense, had him whipped and thrown into a cellar in fetters. And there he lay, hearing sounds of battle. Actually, he could walk about the battlements of the castle if he wished to, because his door was not locked and he yearned to be free and to fight and to satisfy his thirst for glory on the battlefield. He was a born soldier, brave, strong and wild, and he felt very sorry for himself. The sun had set on the day of secure when Abu Mehjan decided to try his luck and plead for his freedom. With the irons restricting his movement, he slowly climbed the stairs to the top of the castle and made his way to where Saad lay on his cot. There he sought forgiveness, but Saad rebuked him severely and ordered him back to his cellar. Heartbroken at his repulse, 
he made his way to the floor of the castle and there met Saad's wife, Salma. Then it occurred to him that perhaps he could slip out to the battlefield without Saad being any the wiser for it. O oh, Salma, O oh, daughter of the people of Khazfa, he implored, are you inclined to be kind? What is it? she asked. Release me and let me borrow the piebald horse. By Allah, I swear that if Allah protects me, I shall return to you and place my feet in the fetters. No, I shall not do that. With his head, Abu Mehjan turned away and slowly dragged his feet towards his cellar. Then, within hearing of Salma, he put his anguish into extemporized verse. It is sufficient sorrow when you see a cavalier deprived, abandoned and bound in shackles. When I stand, these irons detain me, trapped, while others are fighting as if I were deaf to the call. I was once a man with wealth and kinsmen, but have now been left entirely alone. By Allah, I pledge a pledge which I shall not break. If I am freed, I shall never visit the tavern again. This was more than Selma could take. She rushed after him, calling. I seek the pleasure of Allah and accept your promise. Hastily she released him from his fetters, and while he collected his weapons and prepared for the field, she went out, bridled the piebald and brought it round to the rear gate of the castle, which opened on the trench. This magnificent horse belonged to Saad and was known by most soldiers in the army. Abu Mehjan came out through the gate and leapt on to the bare back of the piebald. Now do as you wish, said Salma, and Abu Mehjan rode away in the bright moonlight. Abu Mehjan left the castle like a schoolboy coming out of school and dashing out to play like a fierce and hungry tiger leaping out of his cage and seeking his prey. He galloped to the Muslim right, rode through the Muslim ranks, and with a cry of Allahu Akbar, hurled himself at the Persian front where he killed a man. He galloped back to the rear of the Muslim army, and then behind the Muslim ranks, appearing at the Muslim left where again he assaulted the Persian front and killed a man. Then he galloped along the front, between the two armies, thrilled at his freedom, on a horse which was no less thrilled to be in action. Back and forth he rode between the two armies. Every now and then he would throw a challenge without revealing his name and his challenge was accepted by many Persian champions, all of whom bit the dust at the end of the Muslims' terrible lands. And as if this were not enough, he even wrestled with some and threw them down. Several times he galloped round behind the Muslim army to reappear unexpectedly between the lines, swooping like an eagle and striking like a lion. Stalwarts like Akka, Asim and Tuleha had nothing to teach him, for he excelled all. And this went on for several hours while the rest of the warriors, Muslim and Christians, continued to fight as hard as their exhausted strength would permit. The Muslims marveled at the wondrous sight of Abu Mihjan at war. Some asked, Who is this warrior, the likes of whom we have never seen? Others said, he must be one of Hashim's men, came ahead of the rest, or perhaps Hashim himself. The reference was to the commander of the reinforcements from Syria, Hashim bin Utbah bin Abi Waqas, a famed warrior who had lost an eye at Yarmouk. Yet others remarked, If the Prophet Khizr could take part in battle, this would be Khizr on the piebald. Perhaps Allah has favoured us with him. Saad saw Abu Mihjan from his vantage point on the castle. The bright moonlight provided excellent visibility. Saad saw him fight and win, 
saw him ride about the battlefield and gallop past the foot of the castle behind the Muslim line, but was at a loss to understand what was going on. He muttered, As for the horse, it is my horse. As for the attack, it is the attack of Abu Mihjan. Then he saw some more of the thrilling spectacle and again felt perplexed. By Allah, he said, were not Abu Mihjan imprisoned, I would have sworn that this was Abu Mihjan and that was my piebald. This went on till midnight when the two fronts separated and the fighting ceased. Then the cavalier returned promptly to the castle, took off his weapons and armor and went back to his cell where he put his feet in the fetters. A glow of pride warmed his heart. Feeling happy and contented, broke into verse. Have you ever known the Sakif without honor? I am the finest of them with the sword, and the richest of them in full coats of mail, and the most steadfast of them when men quake in battle. And I am their champion on every day. If you do not know, ask those who do. On the night of Qadisiya they did not know me, or of my escape from prison to battlefield. If now I am imprisoned, it is a test for me. And if I am freed, I shall make the enemy taste of death. Salma was listening at the door while Abu Mihjan recited poetry. When he stopped, she entered. O oh, Abu Mihjan, she asked the warrior poet, For what reason did this man imprison you? She was still in a huff after the trouble she had with Saad the day before and referred to her husband as this man. By Allah, replied Abu Mihjan, he did not imprison me for anything unlawful that I ate or drank, although I was fond of drink during the ignorance. I am a poet, verses slip from my lips to my tongue. He imprisoned me because I recited the verse. When I am dead, bury me by the root of the wine, so my bones will satisfy their thirst for the juice. Do not bury me in a desert, for I fear that when I am dead, I may never taste it again. I shall slake my thirst with clear wine, for I shall remain its slave even after death. Salma remained on not speaking terms with Saad till after the battle was over. Then man and wife made peace, and she told him the story of Abu Mihjan. Saad at once released his prisoner. He sent for him and said, By Allah, I shall never whip you again for drinking after seeing what you have done. And I, by Allah, replied Abu Mihjan, shall never drink again. On this day arrived four swords and four horses which Caliph Umar had sent to Qadisiya, with instructions to Saad to distribute them among heroes. The swords went to Asim bin Amr of the Bani Tamim and to three warriors of the Bani Asad, including Tulaiha and Hamal bin Malik. The horses went to Kaka bin Amr and three stalwarts of the Bani Tamim. After midnight, as the two armies settled down to rest in their camps after the labors of the day, Saad heard the hum of conversation which rose from the Muslim tents. He said to an attendant, If our men keep talking, do not disturb me, for then they feel stronger than their enemy. But if they fall silent, awaken me, because that would be bad. Then Saad bin Abi Waqas, like the rest of his men, took a short, well-earned rest. End of chapter 9